Welcome to the Light Reading Podcast. I'm Phil Harvey. I'm an editor here at Light Reading. And today on the podcast, I'm joined by Kelsey Zeiser, uh, my co-host here at Light Reading. And our guest today, uh, we have two guests. Uh, they're both from Radware. Uh, we have David Aviv, the CTO. He joins us from Tel Aviv. And Mike O'Malley, the VP of Strategy, and he joins us from Chicago. And on the podcast, we'll be talking about um, security concerns that companies are having uh, in light of 5G deployments and multi-access edge computing. Uh, Changes in the network architecture, of course, are changing the uh, available surface area and the types of threats that uh, enterprises are facing. So we'll get into a little bit about what... uh, uh, technologies they're looking at, how they're reacting to those threats. Um, they've also done, uh, Radware's done a security uh, survey of senior executives that talk about uh, cloud migration, and um, we can get into some of the findings there. So it's an interesting uh, conversation that we have about how the network is changing and how the security uh, profile of companies is changing and how security, uh, you know, can be maintained, cybersecurity can be maintained Uh, as these networks evolve. Uh, We'll get into all of that right after this. This episode is brought to you by Avast, global leaders in digital security for network operators. They can build a safer digital world for your customers and their families. Discover more at avast.com slash partners. That's A-V-A-S-T dot com slash partners. Welcome to the Light Reading Podcast. This is Phil Harvey. I'm an editor here at Light Reading, and I'm joined on the podcast by Kelsey Zeiser, my fellow editor at Light Reading. Hello, Kelsey. Hello, Phil. How you doing? Pretty good. Um, Took a a nasty spill walking the dog this morning but i'm okay <laughs> uh-oh well, how's the dog really uh, <laughs> he's fine <laughs> he okay, was consoling good. me <laughs> i was worried about that no uh, um are, but you're not getting uh, this is a, this is a wet weather or just uh just, just clumsy <laughs> yeah oh, okay. i you know mm-hmm. thought flip-flops would be fine but i was wrong <laughs> <laughs> Par for the qu- well yeah uh, it's pandemic dress code everybody we have to <laughs> <laughs> flip-flops all day long um <laughs> Let's see. Okay, we could get into uh, your uh, clumsiness and your dress code, uh, <laughs> but we do we do have uh, bigger and better uh, uh, industry topics to talk about. So joining us today from Radware is uh, David Aviv, uh, C- the CTO, and Mike O'Malley, the VP of Strategy. Uh, first of all, hello, David. How are you? Hi, hi everyone from Tel Aviv. <laughs> yes, you're you're uh, you're you're. Uh, see, so it is what time in Tel Aviv now? About right, eight o'clock uh, at night. It's uh, nine nine p.m. Nine p.m. Okay, so it's two. Just for everybody's reference, it's uh, two twenty uh, or t- two o'clock uh, Eastern uh, U.S. time. And uh, thanks for staying up. I appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, uh, let's see, Mike, uh, you're not uh, you're, you're not anywhere near Tel Aviv, are you? No, I'm in beautiful, sunny Chicago today. All right, fantastic. Um, and winter hasn't hit you yet, right? No, I think we have three more days. Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll in- enjoy them. <laughs> Good. Here in Tel Aviv, you... we have nineties right now. We are on the nineties. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, Weather for so... the for the Mediterranean. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say it's still still very much uh, uh, balmy and sunny and all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas uh, in Chicago, uh, you have you have two seasons. You have winter and not winter. So. <laughs> yeah, That's, yes, and we and we relish every day of not winter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can I'll imagine. <laughs> right. Um, well, okay. Well, we, we uh, you know, to have a CTO on uh, for for a company that's as uh, as well known as Radware, it'd be silly of us not to ask him. You know. Uh, what he's seeing in the in the market right now. So, um, David, if you don't mind, give us a kind of a state of the industry in terms of uh, you know security trends and uh, other developments that you're watching right now. What what's what's on your radar? Well, it's a very broad uh, question, but uh, definitely we do see the five G and the ecosystem around the five G as one pillar. Interesting with the edge compute. 
uh, centralized, and we'll talk a little bit later on, on, on the impact on the moving to an edge-centric architecture, a cloud-centric architecture, cloud-native security threats is another topic, very, very hot topic, also as part mm. of the COVID and the remote access and the lift and shift uh, lift and shift uh, companies that move workloads from data centers into the cloud, the public cloud, and obviously application security. So everything is uh, around how to main, how to build, maintain, and secure applications. And the centric point in, in that world is containers. Everything is moving to run into containers using most of the time Kubernetes orchestration for many reasons as resiliency, scale, and control. And if you package that within a cloud native architecture, well, we have a quite complicated security posture to protect. So cloud native security which encapsulates all the application security, which is web, API, etc. The other end, we have the edge-centric network architectures, both for enterprise and service providers. So this provides quite a wide umbrella of security solutions. And you mentioned um, cloud applications. Are there some new security concerns with so many people um, now you know, relying on their home networks um, for work from home. Are there new security challenges to accessing those cloud applications? Oh, yeah. We are, we are going into a, a new environment in which, you know, the, usually the DevOps team are using their passwords and, and you know, all the, the access uh, posture to provide access, uh, secure access into the cloud. We have recently noticed a high, you know, gaining high momentum on the ATO, which is account takeover, in which via spear, you know, spear phishing, you 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 are able to actually fake identities and run into the cloud. When you have a fake that identity within the cloud, you are able to run, you are able to install a stealth a stealth agent that starts to investigate the internal cloud, map the cloud, find the assets, the more interesting assets in the cloud. Remember, the APIs, the cloud APIs are well-known and well-mapped. So everyone, mm -hmm. if I'm using AWS, Azure, or GCP, I have visibility to all the APIs. I know these not they're, they're, those are not hidden APIs. I know them, I can utilize them, and from there, we have seen so many breaches, you know, some of them are in the public, some less on the public, but everything is again, again is manifested in, I'd like to find out your critical assets, your critical data, if it makes sense in there to blackmail you through ransomware encryption of the a critical data or maintain a stealth way exploitation data, critical data exploitation. So the, the cloud native infrastructure provides a lot of opportunities, but requires also a very intensive security uh, lookup. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that is interesting because you do kind of, uh, when you're moving to an, an environment where, I guess, because of the scalability of the cloud, things are spun up and torn down at a record rate, you know? Uh, so, oh. so having to protect an application throughout that entire process just seems, uh, seems a lot more complex for sure. Oh, you are eating an excellent uh, point, Phil, because... You know, one of the challenges when you move to an application security, a new generation application security, is that you need to spin up the security at the rate, at the speed of the container. There is not, there's no way to build up, to, to build a security posture which is static 
and then expect from that static security posture to provide you protection to dynamically changing applications. So you need to spin up the, the security posture at the speed of the uh, containers. More than that, all the container world is a declarative world. So the security is also a declarative security. So whenever you start spinning up the security, you need to bake it within the DevOps pipeline. So it starts from the left shift, but you know, when you are building the image and you are building the image that you are going to run, uh, also well-defined uh, security, scanning that needs to be done for vulnerabilities and well-designed image. And then when you move it to the runtime, you need to move it packaged with the security container. Within the security container, mostly a company, so solution are using a sidecar solution, which is easy to package and encapsulate within the image. So when you spin up the image, you spin up it with a security solution uh, uh, adapted to the application that is spinned up. So you, you see that the security world, especially in the, in the application side, in the cloud native side, is very dynamic, adaptive, and not reactive. Mm -hmm. Thanks, David. Um, and just switching gears a little bit, Mike, you all recently published a cloud migration and security report. Can you um, give us kind of a high level overview of what some of the key takeaways were there? And were you surprised by any of the results? Sure. Yeah, uh, the, the results were, were surprising in that we saw a lot of the trends that David talks about, particularly with regard to cloud migration. You know, we saw a real step function in terms of those trends accelerating uh, during the, you know, during the pandemic and now as we look to post-pandemic. And so what we saw was, you know, even though 60% uh, of service providers reported reductions in headcount and 40-some per, uh, percent reductions in budgets, we saw accelerating changes in things like cloud and automation. And if you add that to what they were already doing with regard to IoT and 5G, they're really investing very heavily then in, in shifting to these new architectures that David's talking about. So they made a step function in terms of, uh, in terms of architecture, and now they're making those changes permanent. And so what we see is we see them building networks kind of around three ideas going forward. One, making the network, you know, uh, making the network more uh, remote. So preparing for a contactless economy uh, and so that you, you can have remote operations and monitor the network remotely and, and do that cost effectively, but also with fewer humans. Uh, automation around, you know, making it remote by uh, eliminating human error. Uh, making the, so that's number one. Number two, making it more resilient uh, and, uh, and building in additional redundancy and resiliency. And, and that's where you, you look at a lot of the new architectures that they're looking at in terms of securing the cloud to make that a more resilient posture. And then the third thing is to, to future-proof their network for the next reception. So make it more efficient, make it more agile. Uh, as David talked about, you know, in terms of deploying microservices and things like that. And so what we saw then is even coming out of now those changes, they had to make a lot of those changes quickly and now they're patching a lot of the security holes in the cloud to do that. And so even though overall budgets are down, we saw many of them report, in fact, 25% uh, reported uh, that they're shifting money into improving their security posture, investing in better security. And when we asked them where that was going, uh, three quarters of them said that that was going to both cloud and automation. So it ties very, very well to the types of solutions that David's talking about. Did their security uh, strategy change throughout this or did it simply accelerate? Because I, I think it's uh, I think it's interesting to note whether the whether companies had some of these uh, you know some of these things on their mind and sort of in process and then it just sort of uh, the pandemic just sort of fast forwarded you know those plans and those budgets. Correct. I think it's the latter, Phil. 
what we from what we saw in the survey results, basically plans that they had to move more towards cloud, to move towards automation, to move towards changing their security posture with some of these technologies that David's talking about. We saw an acceleration in those plans going forward uh, to really move that timetable up uh, for uh, you know for efficiency and resiliency reasons. That makes sense. Um, so now let's talk about you know uh, I guess what's on the horizon, um, what's upcoming. So obviously you know we're we've talked a little bit about the difficulty in protecting enterprises. Um, you know, while they're doing things like cloud migration and moving more business to the cloud. And then of course, um, you know, multi-access edge computing also adds adds more complexity to it, you know, more endpoints and things like that. Um, maybe uh, David could tell us what, you know, what sort of new emerging technologies are you looking at and and where and where and when might we see those uh, arriving in the market? 5G arena and the edge compute, uh, that convoluted, I call it a convoluted uh, environment when you have spectrum, you have edge compute, and, and you have new services is actually providing some challenges, but a lot of opportunities. So we do see some, I would say, some challenges, and there is an impact, uh, an infrastructure impact on that. We are moving from a well-defined edge to edge cloud, to far edge sites, many local breakouts, as you pointed out. We are moving from an order of tens large data centers to the order of thousands of micro data centers or edge compute. A lot, a lot of them are called and considered micro data centers. And there's also an evolution or revolution at the vendor hardware and software where you move to white label approach, a lot of move to white label approach, etc. So that the the outcome of that is a very clear outcome. 5G inspires transformation to an edge centric edge centric architecture. By that, 5G inspires also the move of computer, computer resource and application push to the edge itself. So in that sense, Everyone that goes and tries to build a security posture to 5G will need to address three key areas. How do we protect the network and the edge or more focal focus on edge protection? Namely, can we do defense at a silicon scale rather than what we do today? The second pillar will be we need to protect the control plane, the 5G core control plane is changing. The control plane is moving to an API rather to diameter in, in, the, in the past. Everything is REST. Everything is web-based, HTTPS-based. Uh, to end, packaged in containers. All the vendors are packaging in containers for resiliency and uh, scale. And the third, obviously, is protecting the service or protecting the applications and which we have now a triad. We have data centers, which edge compute, and we have cloud deployment. So all of those provide uh, a very clear a, a, a very clear trend that security is now pushed or placed at the edge when you push that kind of security to the edge, it's not only a new placement for security functionality, it's also you need to ask yourself if you have the correct algorithm, algorithms to defend the network for inbound, uh, inbound traffic, and which is the edge itself. And, uh, you know, that, that's posi that positions another another challenge being packaging everything together those two things and uh, all of the service provider we are talking right now to are concerned are building those kind of new architectures and are thinking on how to protect the network from the inbound and from the outbound itself does it make sense Phil yeah it does um just to just to make sure I 
understand it. And I'll kind of uh, repeat those three areas or those three uh, things that are happening. So there's first, there's edge protection, which um, maybe at some point we can do that at the silicon level, um, and you know, instead of higher up in the stack. Um, there's the 5G core control plane, uh, because everything's moving to containers. It makes everything more scalable, but it also makes it harder to protect. Um, and then the third thing I picked up on was protecting the, uh, the applications and services. And that has to be done, you know, not just at the data center or in the cloud, but also at the edge of the network as well. Did I get, did I get, get the idea? <laughs> yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, it, it, it it's yeah, it's a, it's a it, it's interesting because it's it's a it's a big job and and the the threat uh you know the the size of the threat is expanding in terms of, you know, the, the uh what is it, what is that word that uh is it, it's oh, attack surface. There's a it's a yeah. bigger attack surface and and that's and then of course it's moving around in the network um you know to different places with different layers of complexity so that it do, it does make security a, m- a much more um interesting proposition and definitely, uh, something that seems like it has to, um, I guess, uh, be, th- be thought through at, at every step of the network, you know, before, um, uh, you know, a- as new services are rolled out, not just something that's, that's, uh, put on after the fact and, uh, you know, it, once the service is live. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and exactly. And, and I would say that, you need in a in a way to bake the security into the network, and that's not easy task. This is very challenging, and you need to bake it in the into the network without shaking the boat too much. So you need to do the forwarding, the routing, and the security. Well, it's a challenge. Mm-hmm. And I think the other part of that, Phil, is just the idea that you know, given the fact that they that service riders pushed so hard into, in, you know, had plans to push so hard into cloud uh, and into the edge, right? What we've learned over the past few months is that people very much want those types of services. So now it's about rolling it out more aggressively and plugging those security holes, as David said, because it's very complicated. Let me add just one point is the economy po- economical point. I mean, you need to find a way to provide security at the edge. As we said, edge is now edge points. We have thousands of thousands of edge points. You know that large tier ones in the US will have 40, 50,000 far edge routers covering, you know, cities and everything. And this might be accelerated to the suburbs as the COVID and the work for home. And those are wide open for different attacks. And, and the economy of scale here is critical because if every endpoint, if used to be before, let's say one gig, two gigs, every endpoint today could be 100 gig at least, 400 gig, maybe one tera as well, depending on the coverage, depending on the slice. If you are running business slices, that might be in the terras. At that point, you ask yourself, okay, I cannot implement the current business model on top of that. We need to find another one in order to address the economy of scale here. In order, because you need to price the bit per seconds and, and the security, how much it will cost you to secure a bit. So let's assume that if you pay $1 per bit forwarding, one bit of forwarding, you need to find the right balance how, to, how much do we pay for the security for that kind of one bit forwarding. So that's another challenge that we're working on. And I must say that uh, we have some creative, innovative solutions for that. Yeah, definitely a lot to juggle there. Well, oh, yeah. we're heading up on um, time for the podcast, but before we go, wanted to ask, um, Mike, where can our listeners um, get a copy of the survey results? So if you go to our website, uh, we have it posted there on uh, on our site in terms of C-suite research. And we also have some uh, great interactive uh, web graphics that you can take a look at. Uh, so you can see some of the different uh, slices of the information as well. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, David Aviv and Mike O'Malley, thanks so much for being on the Light Reading Podcast. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thanks to Avast for their sponsorship this week. Avast's award-winning security solutions make it easy for your customers to stay safe online, no matter how many devices they use. Learn more at avast.com partners. That's A-V-A-S-T dot partners.